Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining today's general membership meeting of the Management Association of the Philippines on addressing the learning crisis. We have a packed but very rich schedule today, but we will try to stay on time. Please settle down comfortably. We will now begin our program. May I request everyone to pause and bow our heads for a short prayer to be followed by the Philippine National Anthem. O most merciful God, we come to you in our weakness. We come to you in our fear. We come to you with trust, for you alone are our hope. We place before you the disease present in our world. We turn to you in our time of need. Bring wisdom to doctors, give understanding to scientists, and thou caregivers with compassion and generosity. Bring healing to those who are ill. Protect those who are most at risk. Give comfort to those who have lost a loved one. Welcome those who have died into your eternal home. Stabilize our communities. Unite us in our compassion. Remove all fear from our hearts and fill us with confidence in your care. Let's take a minute to prepare for the eternal repose of MAP member, Dr. Luis Maria Chiorchito R. Calingo, President of Holy Angel University, who passed away on October 2, 2021, <coughs> at the age of 66. Amen. Amen. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Ayang pag-ibig, kaya sa sigahanan, alam ng puso sa titik ko'y buhay. Upang hinihinam, kuya ka ng mag-ibig, sa mandulupin, di ka pasisigil sa nagadak. his welcome remarks, may I now call on the president of the MAP, who is also the chair of Far Eastern University or FEU, Mr. Gigi Montinola. Our distinguished speakers, friends from the government, diplomatic community, civil society, and media, fellow MAP members, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you. On behalf of the MAP Board of Governors, I welcome all of you to this general membership meeting of MAP on quote addressing the learning <coughs> education crisis, unquote. As most of you know, we've already been highlighting five national crises for the year. Health, which is COVID-19, the economy, which is negative GDP growth and unemployment, the un environmental, which is irreversible climate change, social justice, four and a half million families and 18 million poor, and education, which is the focus of today's general management meeting. Many thanks to our speakers, uh, Secretary Leonor Briones, who's been advocating face-to-face -face learning since even early 2020, uh, Ms. Rina Lopez Bautista, and Mr. Ramon Del Rosario Jr. for sharing their time and expertise with us today. Thanks to the MEP National Issues Committee, co-chaired by Risa Mantaring and Francis Lim, for organizing this GMM. And thank you, Risa, for moderating today's GMM. In pursuing MAP's mission of promoting management excellence for nation building, we've been focusing on three themes, safely reopening the economy, promoting shared prosperity and ESG, 
and enhancing member benefits via best practice sharing. Looking forward, we have a variety of important events um, coming up. We recently had a September 22 and 24 uh, MAP dialogue with university presidents. Uh, today, we will launch the new MAP website. Today, we will announce the election of MAP governors for 2022 to 2023. Um, today, we're going to announce the MAP management man of the year. And um, looking forward to November, we're going to announce a November 12 MAP Next Generation Conference. Um, so it's going to be quite um, um, active. And um, just as in closing, I'd also like to congratulate the MAP CEO Conference Committee. We had an excellent MAP International CEO Conference um, last month. So a round of virtual applause, please. And um, let's look forward to the coming um, events. The, the good news is that we continue to have a very packed schedule. Uh, so far, we've had about 12 uh, general management meetings. We've had about 20 plus organized by the MAP as webinars and more than a hundred or almost 10 a month webinars co-participated in with other groups. So as always, thank you for your participation and good luck. We should have a very interesting uh, conference this afternoon. Thank you, Gigi. For the presentation of new MAP members for induction, I'd like to call on the chair of the membership committee, Senior Legal Counsel of ACRA Law, Attorney Francis Lim. Thank you very much, Risa. Um, do you hear me? Hello? Yes, very clearly. Okay. Um, my fellow members of the MAP, I'm pleased to announce uh, that uh, this afternoon, we're inducting six new MAP members who will increase our total membership from 1,060 to 1,066. May I now read the names of the inductees? The first one is Maria Cristina Gochanun, President and CEO, Semirara Mining and Power Corporation, Line of Business, Exploration, Extraction and Development of the Coal Resources in Semirara, Sponsors, Rose. S. Francisco and yours truly. Second, my friend, Mr. Takeshi Hara, President and CEO, who just uh, came in uh, recently, Mitsubishi Motors Corp uh, Philippines Corporation, line of business, manufacture and distribution of motor vehicles. Sponsors are yours truly and Ms. Risalinas G. Mantarin. Next is Mr. Ray Antonio, uh, Reynaldo Antonio Ray Laguda, President and CEO of the Philippine Business for Social Progress, line of business, NGO, poverty reduction and human development. Sponsors are used truly and Lisa Mantarin. Next is uh, Mr. Sorenda Menon, President and CEO, PPI Life Assur Film Life Assurance Corporation, line of business, um, insurance sponsors, yours truly, and Risa Mantarin. Next, again, I'm um, uh, Mr. Roberto Babitan, my friend, president of the PDIC, line of business deposit insurance coverage for the depositing public. Sponsors are yours truly, and Miss Risa Mantarin. Mr. Ramo, Jose Ramon Bon, Bon Villatuya, president and managing director of. Uh, the Rural Bank of Louisiana, Inc., line of business banking. Sponsors are Mr. Eddie Yap and yours truly. At this point, uh, I would like to call on our MAP president, Gigi Montinola, to lead the online induction of our new members. Okay. Please raise your right hand and uh, repeat after me. I, state I, your name. I. I do hereby solemnly pledge 
that I will perform well and faithfully that I will perform, perform well, well and, faithfully. and faithfully to the best of my ability to the best, best of, of my, ability. Ability. my ability my duties as a regular member my, my duties, duties as a regular, as a regular member. member in order to contribute in, in order, order to, to contribute, contribute to the achievement of the objectives to the achievement of the objectives, objectives of the management association of the philippines the management, the management association of the philippines so help me god so help me god congratulations and welcome to the map thank you for taking the time to join our organization good luck thank you thank you very much Okay. And now, uh, thank you, Francis and Gigi. Now for the uh, congratulations, of course, to all our new members and welcome to MAP. Now for the announcement of the newly elected MAP governors for 2022-2023, may I call on the chair of the MAP Nomination and Election Committee, who is also the chair and president of Multinational Investment Bank Corporation, Ms. Malu Cristobal. Thank you, Riza, and uh, good afternoon, fellow MAP members, distinguished guests, and uh, friends of MAP. It is my pleasure this afternoon to announce the results of our election of MAP governors for the years 2022 and 2023. But before I do so, I'd like to thank the following members of the Nomination and Election Committee, otherwise known as the Nomelec, for their contribution to this year's election. Uh, there's Marivica Espano, the committee governor in charge, Ding Nera, the committee vice chair, and the very able and active members, Ed Amistad, Valendriga, Fred Parungao, and Fern Peña. Thank you very much, lady and gentlemen for your very able contribution <laughs> to making the elections a success. Let me also take the opportunity to thank SGV for doing the independent third party audit and they did so for free. They very generously donated to MAP the cost of their service. Um, let me now go to some statistics which you may find of interest. I'm pleased to announce that 490 members participated in this year's election. This is the highest number of MAP members who voted in any particular year. This year's turnout is a high 46% of the total MAP membership of 1,060 and it is even higher than the 40% turnout posted last year. This turnout is also more than double the 20% quorum required by our bylaws. Now, due to the pandemic and the need for social distancing, the members were requested to vote exclusively via Google form and email. Now, out of the 490 who voted, a big 77% or 378 voted via Google form. The remaining 23% or 112 voted via email. Now at this point, it's my pleasure and my privilege to announce the winners who will serve as governors of the MAP and concurrently as trustees of the MAP Research and Development Foundation for two years. Their term will start on January 1, 2022, and will end on December 31, 2023. These governors elect will join the five incumbent governors, namely Romy Bernardo, Maan Hontiveros, Fred Pascual, Babe Singson, and Wilson Tan on the 2022 board of the MAP. Now, as I call the name of each governor, uh, if you're present in this meeting, do turn on your video so that you can be properly recognized. 
So here is our list of four governors elect, which I will state in alphabetical order and not in the order of the votes or the number of votes that each of them received. So let me repeat that I will be uh, uh, stating the names of the governors elect in alphabetical order. Arnold requested me to put emphasis to the alphabetical arrangement of these four names. So the first in our list is attorney Alexander Alex Cabrera, who's chair emeritus and ESG leader of Isla Lipana and Company, PWC Philippines. Alex is around, please turn on your video. The second in our list is Mrs. Victoria Vicky Garchitorena Arpon, consultant of family philanthropy and corporate social responsibility. The third in our list is Dr. Chielito Chielabito, Chair of Brain Trust, Knowledge and Options for Sustainable Development, Inc. And finally, the fourth in our list is Dr. Donald Patrick, Donald Lim, Chief Operating Officer of Dito CME Holdings, Inc. So congratulations to our new governors and let's please give them all a virtual round of applause. Now, before I, uh, I close, allow me to thank the board for the opportunity to serve as nominee chair for 2021. Over to you, Riza. Yeah. Thank you, Malu. And congratulations to all our newly elected MAP governors for 2022-2023. At this point, we will have the launch of the new MAP website, a project of the MAP Communications Committee and the MAP Board. To lead the launch, may I now call on the co-chair of the MAP Communications Committee and a director of Oracle Wellness Corporation, Asia Pacific College, and the National University, Ms. Susan Dimakali. Thank you. Thank you, Risa. Today is a really exciting day because it's the day that we're going to unveil the new home of the premier management organization in the country, our sleek and refreshed MAP website. Now, um, this is still in the first phase and the beta site, which means that you can still give your inputs for us to consider before we formally launch to the public. Now, Governor Maan Antiveros and I wish to thank our president, Gigi Montinola, whose vision it was to make our digital assets work harder for us, or at least work as hard as Arnold does, and upgrade our website to better reflect the premier image and positioning of MAP. Thank you too to the Secretariat led by Arnold Salvador and Joanna for partnering closely with our digital agency tribal and spearheading the content direction of our website. And Marivic and Leonard for finding ways to create more value for our budget and guidance on uh, milestones and mandatories. Special mention to Governors Romy Bernardo and Alfredo Pascual for their valuable inputs along the way. Also, we'd like to thank our tech partner, Tribal DDB, which is led by Chabs Chua and their group president, MAP member, Hill Chua. This, uh, this revamped website represents who we are in the digital space and the re redesign reflects our mission and values, our commitment to excellence, as well as the stature and responsibility in nation building. Now for a quick glimpse of our new MAP website, let's all watch this teaser before I turn you over to Chabs for the walkthrough. Let's play the video. So thank you um, for a detailed walkthrough of the phase one of our website. I turn you over now to Tribal DDB's chance. Thanks, Ms. Sue. 
We'll just flash on the screen our new MAP website. So welcome to MAP's new website. Let's go to map.net.ph. It's designed mobile first because we know most of our members view on their mobile phones. And as you can see here, the site is responsive. So whatever screen you're viewing, whether it's your laptop, tablet, or phone, it will be easy to use and read. So for our phase one site sections, you'll land on our homepage, our hub for all of our information, and essentially MAP at a glance. So you'll find our banners here for important announcements, which link to inner pages. We have our welcome banner, the next gen event, the management man of the year, which will update. We will update after the exciting announcement later. And of course, our year's theme, the great reset. There's also the sidebar for important announcements that we want to highlight. So we also have our summary of our latest updates and must attend events, our news articles, advocacies, galleries, and archives. And it's easy to navigate. Um, at the footer as well, you'll see our contact details. So moving on to our About Us section, um, it's really the complete information about our vision, our mission, and it also has a video that introduces MAP to the world as nation builders. It also has our officers, the president, the governors, and committees. And we'll also see the data privacy um, section there as well. All right, moving on to programs. This shows all of our upcoming events to make sure members know the schedules and promote higher attendance by giving more information about the event. So say I'm interested in the special general membership meeting and I click on it. Let's click on that. I will see the details of the event, see what it's all about, what the topic is, who the speakers are, and best of all, I can actually just click to register on Zoom. No need to leave the site, right? So you can go back to the other sections of the site anytime and see what other events you would like to attend as well. You'll see at the bottom of our uh, programs would be our different advocacies, which are very important to the MEP. So next would be our memberships. If we go to that section, where we provide information on who is qualified to be invited to MAP, as this is an invite-only uh, premier organization, right? So you can um, provide their details uh, to register their interests um, should they fit the uh, category. So for resources as well, um, this is to get informed with the different statements and bulletins for its members in one section. So we see here organized content based on circulars, statements, MAP, tax bulletins, memos, minutes, and presentations. You don't need to wonder where those past information given um, is anymore. It's all here. And finally, on our gallery, these are the different photos and videos of our publicly available content, should you wish to revisit past events. Uh, this is arranged per year, and we're still populating this some more. You also need, don't need to browse through the whole site. You can just um, look into the search button. So you can search for content that you may need. Say, I want to search for memos. I just type it in, and it'll appear for me. So the site indexing will get better as we use it more often, but as you can see, it's really quick and easy to use. So that's a quick overview of our site to represent the movers and shakers in the Philippines. And please consider this as a dynamic hub. Um, so it will be constantly updated and easy to use, uh, of course, by our secretariat team. So we encourage you to explore the site and please give us feedback so that we can improve it further. I turn you back over to Ms. Sue. Thank you. Um, you can now actually explore the, the site at map.net.ph. And as promised, it is easily accessible through Viber. In fact, I think Arnold has sent already a link through to Viber for the latest article about Maria Ressa winning the Nobel Prize. He also sent another link to register for our latest event. And if you, if you click on your Viber to those links, you will see how quick and easy it is to land on the website and of course drive traffic there. Um, in the coming months, we will be working on our phase two launch, which will have our membership portal. We will have the ability to, to, to divide content into public as well as for exclusive members only content and events. There will be logins, voting, joining committees and community groups and set up Google Forms and so on. So it's infinitely more, uh, more convenient. 
And we welcome your ideas, of course, for features you'd like to see for phase two. Um, so that's it pretty much, uh, everyone. Our time is kind of limited today, so it'll be good if you could check out our website over the next few days and share with us your inputs. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sue. That's a great update of the website and uh, it certainly looks much more attractive now. I, I hope it will also attract more members to join us. <laughs> now yep. we come to one of the most awaited portions annually in MAP, one of the most awaited events, is just the presentation of the MAP Management Man of the Year for 2021 for the approval of the MAP members. May I call on the chair of the MAP MMY Judging Committee and the CEO of De La Salle Philippines, Mr. Ed Chua. Thank you very much, uh, Risa. Our distinguished guests, fellow MAP members, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to thank the MAP Board of Governors for the opportunity to again serve as chairman of this year's MAP Management Man of the Year Judging Committee. On behalf of the MMY Judging Committee, I'm here to present to the MAP membership our committee's choice for the MEP Management Man of the Year 2021, who was approved by the MEP Board of Governors at their meeting this morning. As most of you know, the MEP has been in the forefront of promoting management excellence for nation building. MEP has presented the MEP Management Man of the Year Award for over five decades to recognize outstanding achievements of any individual in the private sector or in government, whether MEP member or not, who has exceptionally distinguished himself or herself in the practice of management. Our criteria for the award include the following. First, integrity, prestige, and distinction in the business community. Second, high qualities as a manager exemplified in his or her leadership, vision, decisiveness, fairness, and firmness in dealing with people. Third, exceptional ability for performing his or her managerial functions under exceptional conditions such as creating and managing a new enterprise, reorganizing and reorienting an existing enterprise, turning around a moribund company, considering the difficulties of the times. Fourth, active and continuous management at top level of a private business or industrial enterprise or a government institution for a significant length of time and in a manner highly deserving of the recognition and commendation of MAP by reason of his or her contribution to the advancement of management as a career in the Philippines. Fifth, contribution to reshaping national values and orientation. Sixth, effective service and tangible contribution to nationwide professional, social, civic, or charitable undertakings through personal initiative. Seventh, the organization under his or her stewardship must have exhibited consistent exemplary performance and achieved stability under the highest standards of business ethics and practice. And lastly, the organization must be an entity operating in the Philippines and the business must have contributed substantially to the growth and development of the Philippine economy. Now that the search process has been completed, please allow me to publicly thank the other members of the MMY uh, judging committee who are past awardees and or past presidents as stipulated in the MEP bylaws. May I ask them to please turn on their videos if they're present the vice chair is attorney Lilia De Lima. This is her third time to serve as vice chair of the judging committee. She was vice chair in 2013 and 2020. Three are both MMY awardees and past presidents. Ramon Del Rosario Jr., MMY 2010, president in 1989. Johnny Santos, MMY 1994, president in 2000. Yours truly, MMY 2013, president in 2008. Three are MMY awardees, Moncho Aboitis, MMY 2011, Lilia De Lima, MMY 2010, Prime Minister Cesar Virata, MMY 1981, while one is a past president, that's Mon Paterno, president in 2008. Thanks are also in order to the following members of the MMY search committee. Chair is MAP immediate past president Francis Lim. Vice chair is MAP 2019 president Riza Mantarin. Members are Popoy Del Rosario, President in 2015, Mon Fernandez, President in 2018, Ed Francisco, President in 2012, Peripe, President in 2016, and Marife Zamora, President in 2017. As most of you know, the search for MAP Management Man of the Year involves a tedious process. Nominations are generated from the membership with the help of the MMY Search Committee. 
To ensure a wide search of potential awardees, the MEP Board of Governors has institutionalized the MMY Search Committee, headed by MEP's immediate past president, to identify and propose nominees for the award. The nominees then go through a rigid screening by the MMY Judging Committee, which, as provided for in our bylaws, is composed of selected past presidents and past awardees. With the exception of the chair and the vice chair, the names of the members of the MMY Judging Committee are not announced until such time that the judging process has been completed. The MMY Judging Committee served as the board of judges that chose the most deserving candidate for this year. All seven members of the Judging Committee were present in our October 4 judging. At the start of the judging, we had the first secret voting via Viber, where the seven committee members were asked to rank their top three candidates from among the seven nominees. In the tabulation of the scores, number one got three points, number two, two points, and number three, one point. Four candidates who got the highest number of votes in the first secret voting were then subjected to the second secret voting. The committee members were requested to select their top two choices from the top four nominees, uh, which came out in the first secret voting. In the tabulation, the number one would get two points and the number two, one point. After the second secret voting, the committee was able to choose a clear winner. After discussion on the accomplishments of the winner, our committee made a unanimous decision to endorse that particular candidate for the award. The MMY Judging Committee's choice was then presented to the MEP Board of Governors for approval at its meeting this morning. And then we're presenting it to the membership in today's MEP General Membership Meeting. If our awardee is approved by the general membership, the signatories to the citation will be Gigi Montinola as MEP President, Francis Lim as Chair of the MMY Search Committee, and yours truly as Chair of the MMY Judging Committee. Our awardee this year will be the 45th recipient of the award. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you the choice of the MMY Judging Committee, who has been approved by the MAP Board of Governors. The MAP Management Man of the Year 2021 awardee is, there are no uh, drums or anything, it's Ambassador Carlos Chan, Chair of Liwaiwai Holdings Company Limited. Ambassador Chan was chosen for the following. One, for his business acumen and management qualities in transforming a local cornstarch repacking business into an international snack manufacturing company. Two, for being an exemplar of the Filipino entrepreneurial spirit that is globally competitive. Three, for his leadership role in the substantial contributions of the Liwaiwai Group to national development through technology improvements, product development, skills training, job creation and income generation. Four, for his contributions to shaping national values and inspiring others by his outstanding achievements attained from humble beginnings through hard work, perseverance and discipline. And fifth, for setting an example for Filipino managers through a track record of integrity, entrepreneurial excellence, managerial competence and professional leadership in his management career in both private and public sectors. I trust that you agree with the recommendation of our MMY Judging Committee and the MAP Board of the MAP Management Man of the Year 2021. At this point, may I request the general membership to signify your approval by posting your approved message through the chat button. And if there are any dissents, please relay your disapproval also through the chat button. Okay, there being no dissent, we now consider our recommendation as approved by the MAP membership. If there are no objections, may we request you to give our MAP Management Man of the Year 2021 a big round of applause, please, from wherever you are. As chair of the MMY Judging Committee, I would like to thank the MAP Board of Governors as well as the MAP General Membership for approving our committee's recommendation. The conferment of the award will be tentatively scheduled on November 22, 
uh, but that will be finalized depending on the availability of the awardee. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ed, and congratulations to our MAP Management Man of the Year 2021. Now we go on to our main speakers this afternoon. Some reminders, please, before we start the presentations of our speakers. As participants for this GMM, you're automatically muted and your camera is switched off. You may submit your questions to the Q&A box that you see on your screen. And with the assistance of our MAP Secretariat, I will read the questions on your behalf. And for your information, you will only be able to see the speakers, but you will not be able to view the other participants. In line with MAP policy and in the interest of time, we will dispense with the lengthy introduction of our speakers. I would like to remind our speakers that they are given five to 10 minutes for their presentation. So please excuse me if I have to remind you if you're already going over time. So may I call on our first speaker? Please welcome the Chair of Philippine Business for Education or PBED, Mr. Ramon Del Rosario Jr. Thank you, thank you very much, Risa. First, let me join my MAP colleagues in congratulating this year's Management Man of the Year, Ambassador Carlos Jan. Very, very well deserved. And also, congratulations to the new members of the Board of Governors. Again, you will have uh, an outstanding board as usual. Congratulations to them and to MAP. My esteemed co-speakers, DepEd Secretary Leonor, Leonor Briones, Knowledge Channel co-founder Risa Lopez Bautista, ladies and gentlemen who are tuned in through social media, a pleasant good afternoon to all. There is no better time than now to talk about a great reset. We are at the throes of an almost two year COVID-19 pandemic. At the moment, the virus is still raging with its more infectious variants. This may bring continuing uncertainty as there is still no clear end in sight. But it should not stop us from living in the present and doing what we should and what we can. From a strategic standpoint, we must pivot and recalibrate. We know that this crisis has shown a much brighter light on the plight of our people on poverty and inequality. And it has allowed us to delve deeper into these problems. With so much to rebuild, now is the time for us to address these issues fundamentally. For businesses, it cannot just be about picking up the pace and returning to previous levels of profitability. Importantly, it should be about contributing to a more just society, increasing employment and improving wages, serving the underserved and reaching the last mile. Vital to the recovery and prosperity of our nation is education, as it is the single most effective way of bringing people out of poverty. Taking a reset in education, building up on existing reform efforts, we at Philippine Business for Education believe that the learning crisis should be addressed comprehensively from the ground up First, we have to understand that this crisis is a result of accumulated years of unsustained policies and reform efforts. No one administration or generation is at fault, which is why now is the best time to make sure the cracks in the education sector don't further deepen. Now is the time to close the gaps before it is too late. At Tibet, we like to say, educación muna, educación naman. Just like building a house, which for many individuals is a form of reset, Similarly, we propose a rethink of the education system by building a new house of reform. The house of reform needs to be built on a solid foundation. This starts with a reconstitution of the Education Commission or EDCOM. The new EDCOM should be participated in by representatives from the academe, the business sector, civil society organizations, teacher organizations, as well as students and their parents. The EDCOM can review and assess our education system and propose strategic ways forward. They will be a multi-sectoral task force that will analyze the gaps, look for opportunities, and pave the ground on which we build our reform efforts. Upon this ground, we should build five foundational reforms. First, we call on the government to reimagine education to be adaptive to the new normal. It should also be reflected in the utilization of education budgets. Earmarking some of the funds freed up because of the mandana 
could significantly increase LGU budgets for priority programs. For example, this can be used to build COVID safe learning spaces and provide digital learning resources, especially for last mile schools. Second, we need to address malnutrition and stunting among children. These take a toll on brain development and the student's readiness and ability to learn. Inadequate learning results in low adult earnings. We need to implement the Philippine Plan of Action for Nutrition so that no child is too hungry to participate in class. Third, we need to strengthen the implementation of the mother tongue-based multiling multilingual education. Learning foundational lessons in the native language gives the children the head start they need in school. Next, teachers have the strongest influence on the learning of our students. Thus, it is important that we ensure the quality of educators. Our fourth recommendation is to pass the Teacher Education for Achievers or TEACH bill. This will establish a teacher education scholarship program. The goal is to deliver highly competent teachers into the system by attracting the best and the brightest to join the profession. Finally, we need to effectively assess learning to see how we can improve curriculum and instruction and bridge learning gaps. The assessment agency in charge of this task should be independent and hold the highest integrity in producing data. To hold the structure of the House of Reforms, we have to build strong walls and pillars. We need civil society and the private sector to provide support in education governance. On one side is the improved complementarity between public and private education. There are resources and expertise in both public and private education that can be leveraged to deliver better learning outcomes. The other is creating venues for interaction through improved work-based training. This way, we can integrate the private sector and the industry's standards, rules, and delivery of education and training. To serve as protection from the ever-changing global socioeconomic landscape is our push for lifelong learning. Education does not stop in the formal system. There are more competencies and skills that people can acquire outside institutions. This enhances employability and workforce development. We are currently pushing for the passage of the Jobs Next Bill. This creates a skills voucher program that will ensure that our people continue to learn and obtain skills for the jobs of the future. These policy recommendations are what we have constantly pushed for in order to, to address the learning crisis. The good news is we have already reached policy milestones in Congress. The EDCOM resolutions we supported in Congress in 2019 have gone through a series of hearings in July of this year. These have already been reviewed by the technical working groups in the Senate and are now being prepared for plenary discussions. The TEACH bill and the Jobs Next bill are already filed in Congress as well. In the South, in Mindanao, discussions in, on implementing a teacher education scholarship program are ongoing between PBED and the Ministry of Basic Education of the Bangsamoro Autonom Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. This is true to our mission of working for an inclusive quality education for every Filipino to lead productive lives and contribute to national development. Ladies and gentlemen, each of us can be builders of the reform house. We cannot afford to lose more in the future when we can find ways and use resources to address, to arrest the learning crisis now. We understand that these reform efforts are by no means exhaustive and we all have unique contributions to give. We thus invite everyone, members of the MAP and everyone tuned in today to take part in building a strong education system by joining the recently relaunched Education Nation. This is a coalition of groups, organizations, and even individuals who share a common goal for better education. It is a united front working towards electing a leader who will put education on top of our nation's agenda. Education Nation's standpoint agenda for education reform builds on existing reform efforts already started by the previous and current administrations, like Sulong Educalidad that Secretary Liling's administration is championing. We humbly ask for Secretary Liling's endorsement as we work towards ensuring that the 10-point agenda be adopted by all candidates in the coming elections. We can all do something as builders of this reform house and the citizens of this nation. It is through our influence, our voice, that we can truly lead for the common good. And so 
Let me end by calling on everyone to elect an education president and education champions in the 2022 elections. Constructing this house, our efforts towards a great reset will need capable leaders on site. This will be our legacy that will enable the future generation to lead better and productive lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramon, for that uh, very concise but comprehensive uh, presentation. For second speaker, may I please call on the co-founder and president of Knowledge Channel, Ms. Rina Lopez Bautista. Thank you, Risa. And thank you, Chairman Gigi Montinola and Attorney Francis Lim for inviting me to this insightful discussion. Congratulations to Ambassador Carlos Chan and to the new governors and members of MAP. To my co-panelists and speakers, Secretary, Secretary Leonor Briones and Mr. Ramon Del Rosario Jr., my chairman at the PBED. To all the members of MAP and everyone watching this general membership meeting today, a pleasant day to you, wherever you are in the world. Mabuhay. Um, the, the, the Knowledge Channel uh, Foundation, a nonprofit established in 1999, started off as the first uh, curriculum-based educational TV channel in the Philippines. But the foundation has evolved into a teaching and learning ecosystem with platforms, um, content trainings, and special projects. When the pandemic struck, our already fragile education system became even more fragile with a sudden shift to alternative learning modalities. The new learning setup also increased the need for technology and internet connectivity. This remains a major concern in our country. So how did the Knowledge Channel respond to the pandemic and the fragility of our education system? Sorry, uh, can we move forward? Uh, next slide, please. The Knowledge Channel TV has a 17-hour curriculum programming per day with time slots for each key subject uh, per grade level with replays for grades one to three, and even for parents and for teachers. The channel airs on various TV platforms, uh, GSAT, Sky Cable, Signal, Satellite, and close to 400 cable TV uh, services around the country. We also have a two hour slot on free TV, A to Z, channel 11. And our channel is now back on digital TV. Homes can see us again in the Mahiwagang black box. So we also brought our uh, channel online via I Want PFC and our content on the Knowledge Channel website, YouTube channel, Just Love Kids. Our shorter content are also on TikTok. And uh, we run an 11 a.m. Monday to Friday live broadcast on Facebook and Google. Because not everyone has on-air and online access to our videos, we also provide our content offline via KC Portable Media Library and Knowledge TV. The thousands of videos we acquired and produced over the years were painstakingly realigned and new videos were produced and sourced to match the DepEd K-12 most essential learning competencies 100%. We have videos as well as educational games in math, English, Filipino science, and other areas. And topics such as agriculture, climate change, health, and uh, others. Pre-pandemic, we were conducting a teacher training program called Learning Effectively Through Enhanced and Evidence-Based Pedagogies. During the lockdown, we converted it into the Knowledge Channel Teaching in the New Normal Training Program. Here we equip teachers and principals with knowledge and skills in distance learning, at distance teaching and learning. When we provide offline content to the teachers through our portable media libraries or hard drives, we also make sure that we train them on how to use it effectively in their class. Hence, the Knowledge Channel Technical Training. In 2018, the World Bank published a World Development Report saying that the global learning crisis exists in many low and middle income countries. Children are not learning well, even if they are in school, and that for some countries, it could take hundreds of years for these children to catch up to the standards of education of developed or rich countries. 
While the Philippines was not part of this study, it is not exempt from experiencing a crisis in learning, as evidenced by various international benchmarking tests like the PISA, the TIMS, UNICEF's uh, Southeast Asia Primary Learning Metrics Assessment, or CPLM, and other local assessments. But we already knew this, as, ba as back in 2016 to 2018, we ran Math the Leap, a program for teaching grade four math with educational videos, interactive games, and teacher trainings, and year-long mentoring uh, as components. Findings were that while MathDeli significantly improved the learning of students with the videos and teacher training, students lacked strong foundational skills in early language literacy and numeracy, did not allow them to excel. This prodded us to be more strategic in our response. And so our strategic response to the learning crisis is to focus and prioritize the early childhood development stage of zero to eight years old. The preschool or zero to four year olds and primary grade learning, kinder to grade three or the five to eight year olds. We embarked in 2018 on a multi-year program called the Basa Bilang, which is the development of hundreds of video lessons in early reading, uh, Filipino, English, and math from grades one to three. We launched Wikaharian, our Filipino language literacy series for grade one, and we'll be piloting Ready, Set, Read, our English series for grade one. We've uh, coupled these videos um, with teacher training and mentoring. The pilot study results for Wikaharian showed significant improvement in learning, not only of average students, but also of at-risk readers or those who have high chances of failing academically. Teachers also shared that their students are more engaged now more than ever, and that the training has helped them reinvent the way they teach. We patted ourselves on the back, thinking that we were addressing the problem at the lowest level and most foundational of skills, only to be brought face to face with facts that proved there was still a lower level, early childhood. This is when the most massive and unimaginable development happens in the brain and when it is most sensitive to the environment. Neuroscience has told us that 90% of brain development happens before the age of five. And the enriching or adverse experiences of a child during this time affects his or her foundations in lifelong health, learning, and behavior with long-term consequences in schooling, diseases, productivity, and earnings. They say it's a period of development which really only comes once. And if you miss it, there are some fairly long-term consequences for life course outcomes. More than 50% of three to four year olds do not attend preschool. And for those in preschool, only one out of four are served by accredited daycare workers. And yet various studies have shown that even just one year of quality preschool makes a big difference in the traje trajectory of their life. The capacities of parents, caregivers, teachers, family members who share and the responsibility and care for young children are essential. This is the reason we are now putting a lot of effort in ECD, in video content, and in training the people who are involved in the care of children in their early years. We developed 10 video lessons featuring early childhood care and development concepts for children three to four years old, parents and other caregivers of children zero, ages zero to four years old. Since last year, we've trained over 700 children, de child development workers, parents, and barangay health workers and nutrition scholars uh, in various parts of the country to build the capacity of caregivers and teachers. Those who've participated in our ECD trainings have found it extremely helpful and have been inspired to embrace their roles and excel in what they do so they can deliver the best early childhood care to the children in their daycare centers. The learning crisis the health and economic crisis brought about by the pandemic, the fourth industrial revolution, climate change, worsening poverty, have made the Filipino even more vulnerable. We need to respond, reimagine, and emerge even stronger. There is no other way but up, and we can only do this if we work collaboratively. I invite all of you at MAP to join us, to be relentless in addressing the learning crisis and helping our children 
not just to survive, but to thrive and flourish. We who are in the Ma Management Association of the Philippines, our goal is to build the nation. And what better way to build the nation and develop management excellence and executive functions, but through the education of very young children. It is a longer haul, but strategic and worth the investment. This could really be an integral component of our great reset. The pandemic has taught us that only through working together can we conquer the challenges of today and tomorrow. Let's learn from this, experience, and act together. Act fast and act now. As we always say in Knowledge Channel, ang saya matuto ng bago. Maraming salamat. Thank you, Rina. I uh, that that's that uh, you know I think very few people would realize how much work you're actually doing in Knowledge Channel beyond just what's happening on TV. And I hope that was educational and eye-opening for a lot of our members. I'd like to remind everyone to please uh, type your questions into the chat box or in uh, the Q and A box, sorry, so that we can ask them after our last speaker. So I'm sure you're, we're all waiting to hear from Secretary of the Department of Education, Secretary Leonor Embriones. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, good afternoon, magandang hapon sa lahat. Uh, special greetings to my uh, co-panelists, um, Ms. Bautista, and of course, my very good friend and uh, colleague, uh, Mon Del Rosario. Um, we are, we have common uh, interests aside from debating about education. Uh, we love one institution of which he was former chairman and which I inherited, which is the uh, National uh, Museum. And by the way, Mon, uh, the Manila Concert Choir, which I chair, has produced a video uh, of the Sulong Idokalidad, and the setting is the Tree of Life, because it's my very favorite uh, uh, structure. Uh, Mon and I also have an ongoing debate. He insists that his university is the best management university uh, in the country. And I constantly debate with him because I also insist that my university where I did my undergraduate work is also the best. So it is an ongoing uh, conversation with so much teasing uh, and joking uh, all around. Generations of my family go to this university and I suppose generations of his family goes to this other a university and it's a source of, uh, of fun for us. But uh, the National Museum, we both uh, love and uh, serve. Um, I thought, so hin wag mo munang bilangin yun, introduction lang yun sa five minutes ko. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you, uh, Management Association of the, of the Philippines. If, uh, this is my first time to address your group. And I think uh, all of us realize that both the public and the private sector have common roots, common practices, especially in the matter of strategies, of approaches, of techniques. In the field of public administration, we borrow very much from private sector management practices. And uh, you are all aware of that from planning to management, human relations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have adopted many of your theories. And at the same time, those in the private sector are now into the production of public goods and also are absorbing concepts of social development, caring for the country uh, over and above the market, of course. So there's a lot of uh, exchange of uh, approaches to management and the common uh, uh, the common interest of course is in better management and efficiency whether public or private sector now bilang ka na risa yung uh, i thought that first i would clarify because every time there is a new administration 
education is uh, of great interest and always there is a declaration of a crisis. Uh, when I came in, um, I had an opportunity to talk my, to my immediate predecessor. And so the first question that I asked him, and I hope he recalls it, I said, do you agree that there is a crisis in education? Because every so often, there is a massive uh, call of despair and uh, saying that we have uh, a debate on uh, a crisis in education, going back to Monroe Doctrine, the Monroe Report, going back to EDCOM and all the various administrations. Now, uh, a crisis, he, he thought very carefully, my predecessor, and he said, it's not so much a, a crisis as a chronic disease, as a chronic illness, which uh, whose uh, symptoms surface and could lead perhaps, I don't know, to a crisis, but he said, it is more of a chronic illness which crops up every so often in an environment of very, very uh, noisy political, social, and economic factors. A crisis, they say, is a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger. It's also a time, and I'm thinking of Mon's challenge a while ago, when a difficult or important decision must be made. But a chronic illness persists for a long time and constantly recurs, which has been happening for the past 123 years, ever since uh, the Americans put up the uh, earliest form of the Department of Education, uh, which shaped what it is like right now. Or chronic is a long lasting problem, which is difficult to eradicate. Now, since you are big boys and girls already, I will not try to influence you uh, on this debate, whether there is a learning crisis or a chronic crisis, every time we are on the verge of a change of an administration, because you can judge that for yourselves. I recall, uh, I don't know if any of you recall former Secretary of Education, Mona Valisno, uh, when she said in her book, just before my immediate predecessor took over, uh, the Philippine education system is no different from a man diagnosed bucket man, men and women with a debilitating disease. Every incoming administration is likened to a doctor with an antidote for such a disease. But this one, I really love this one, that the next one. And she said in her book, our very own educational system is like a man without trains flighty, inclusive, ambivalent. Nevertheless, it is promising, it is ambitious, and it is hopeful. I love this one. As a country, we race against despair in our quest for world-class education. This is a race against despair because we continually, every so often, we despair, even as we also celebrate. Next, please. Now, before the pandemic, before napipisa tayo sa PISA, we already recognized that the biggest challenge was quality when I first came in. And so, and Mon is familiar with this, we introduced Sulong Edukalidad, quality education. And there are four components here. One, one of my earliest, my first instruction was to review the K-12 curriculum with more than 15,000 learning competencies which were required. And we have to improve the learning environment, our infrastructure, our, our uh, facilities, and so on. And third, which is very, very important, my favorite author uh, and uh, scientist, uh, he passed on at uh, the age of past 70, uh, teachers upskilling and reskilling. And he said that wherever you have a brilliant student, you can be sure there is a brilliant and devoted teacher 
and we have to devote our time to upskilling and reskilling our teachers in the light of all these new developments. And the fourth is where the challenge of MON comes in, the engagement of stakeholders for support and for collaboration, because this is a challenge there is, this is a race against despair. I really love that phrase, race against despair, because we, we are in despair on what to do about education and our ambitions for world-class standing. Next. So before pandemic, before PISA, before all these international assessments, we already identified education quality. So next, please. The PISA, I don't have to repeat because uh, Secretary Sani uh, explained uh, what we tried to do. PISA, as all of you know, was started in 2000. During that time, there were seven secretaries of education since the year of our Lord 2000, plus two officers in charge. And it is only the eighth secretary of education in the year 2018 who decided that we should join PISA, that we should finally, finally look at the mirror in relation to uh, the world uh, standards. Next, please. And so, next, please. And in our fight for access and quality, uh, a while ago, Mon mentioned uh, the budget and uh, the teachers, of course, are the focus of much of our attention because producing exceptional students would take exceptional teachers and we endeavor to take care of their welfare. The general impression is that our teachers are underpaid uh, and that they are suffering, et cetera, et cetera. But if you will look from the year 2016 when this Secretary of Education came in, uh, the salaries with the executive order and also salary standardization, every year there has been an increase in the salaries of teachers from teacher one to three. I believe that you should be informed of this because you are major taxpayers. And also the highest level of teaching is for the master teacher four. And this is now the year of our Lord 2021. Um, the monthly salary of a master teacher, basic salary is 60,901, while a teacher one is 23,877, which compares or sometimes even exceeds uh, the other professions, those who also serve the government, those who also serve our people. Next, please. Um, this, again, as taxpayers, you deserve to know what are the benefits and allowances that our teachers are now receiving under the 2021 budget? Uh, you have the personal economic relief allowance. You have the clothing and uniform allowance. We give it to them in cash. It's up to them whether they will buy you uniforms or they just uh, uh, continue wearing their uh, current uniforms. The mid-year bonus. You have the special hardship uh, allowance, which is provided for by the Department of Budget and Management. You have the honoraria for teaching overload for a maximum of 25% of basic salary. And during the World Teachers Day incentive, which was started by this present secretary, uh, we give a gift of 1,000 per teacher. This year, it cost us 910 million pesos to give each of the 900,000 teachers 1,000 pesos in recognition of their uh, sacrifices and their contributions to education. We have the year-end bonus. Then we also have the usual representation allowance, which you have in the private sector. And then you have the step in at least three pages of benefits and allowances because everybody, the legislature, all of us love our teachers and everything is done to make them comfortable and to recognize their contributions to education the usual cash allowance and so on and so forth. Okay, next. And so we were in the middle of all these uh, efforts 
the Sulong y Localidad, which uh, Mon and colleagues are familiar with, when uh, the COVID pandemic uh, uh, erupted. And at that time, the choice was between locking down our schools and continuing with education. The decision was very clear. We continue with education. And this is why I am surprised that all over the world, we are excoriated for having the longest closure of schools when we did not close our schools at all. Uh, lockdown was declared in March. Uh, we opened in, in October last year. And this year, we opened on September 13 on blended education because of the limitations and positions of law, which mandates the president to make decisions on the opening of school year. But we did not stop the process of learning. Okay, next. And so we, we have pointed out that the impact on public and private schools closures. Also, we have pointed out that the inequality gaps and, and Bon and uh, Ms. Bautista have pointed this out. And also we have warned against, even at the beginning of the declaration of lockdowns, I already warned against long-term learning uh, losses and, and, and all these uh, dangers. And this is why we suggested that we go on pilot uh, and find out what else we can do to prepare and to pave the way for eventual face-to-face. -face. Next, please. And so what is the enrollment status at this time? Uh, the current levels of enrollment is 28,219,623 students compared to last year's 26,227, 26, an increase of 2 million. And this is uh, reflected in the fact that the economy is slowly recovering and slowly being opened, although there are always setbacks. Uh, before the pandemic, our enrollment was 27 million. It went down to 26 million, and now it is 28 million, uh, including uh, Philippine schools overseas, as well as the alternative learning systems, which we do not include because this is non-formal education. So it is not correct, as cited in international uh, uh, accounts, that closed schools have been closed. We opened last year in October, this year, we open on September 13. And as Ms. Bautista pointed out, we went into blended learning. There were difficulties and challenges, but nevertheless, we continued. And we said, learning must continue. Next, please. And so we go now to the famous uh, pilot face-to-face -face classes, or as we in our region say it, face-to-face -face classes because we recognize the limitations of distance learning. So we believe that if the pilot is critical for the expanded space and we need your support. And this is not just DepEd, it is DepEd and the Department of Health and the IATF because the fear always is that the health issues will uh, will uh, come in and there will be new variants, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> what we did uh, very, very quickly. Uh, next, please. Uh, we have the pilot implementation. We will expand by next year. And then hopefully we will move on to the new normal, barring uh, any dramatic uh, dramatic uh, changes or dramatic developments or dramatic noises uh, from our very watchful environment. Okay. Now, the, the principle here, and, and this is where uh, Mon and I have the most agreement, is that it is a shared responsibility. Um, said that we will only open pilot uh, classes, schools, in local governments who give their consent because we are going to do it in the respective territories. Secondly, we have to have the written consent of the parents because as you know, not all parents are exactly 
uh, for face to face, especially for the younger children. And then we are interested in including the most marginalized because our shift to bl blended learning has surfaced many problems of inequality because of the requirements of technology. And again, this is where the private sector has been helping out as well as other agencies of government. Okay, next please. So far, we started, and I have said this before, we started with 1,900 schools, which we identified. And legislators said, what kind of pilot is that? You have too many. But then I said, we have 61,000 schools. And so we said, okay, 600 schools. Uh, it was still considered too large. So Sabinamen, 100, just so we can start the, the, the pilot. Now, uh, the president first of uh, this early this year approved it with a full 100% uh, support of the cabinet and the IATF. We were already going to implement it when UK variant came in. And so it was postponed again. Now the latest is we have submitted to the Department of Health because the Department of Health has to vet the um, uh, state of the local government where the schools will be open. Uh, they have selected out of the 100, they have identified 59 public schools from 638, which we nominated from 1,900 schools, which passed granular risk assessment. So you don't look as an entire province or an entire municipality. You look at the very places where the schools are located. And then we have uh, this rolling assessment. So every Monday, that means yesterday, uh, we met with the Department of Health and they reassessed uh, their endorsement of the 59 public schools. In the meantime, several local governments have uh, decided that uh, they will uh, still observe what is, what is happening. And so we're saying that we're instructed our regional directors because there are local governments who are not in the list of the Department of Health, but who are prepared to host such pilot schools that they should sum submit immediately uh, specific schools so that DOH can make the evaluation. The instructions uh, on the, op the pilot is very, very clear. The, it, the list has to be vetted by the Department of Health and the protocols have to be followed considering uh, the risks that are involved. Next, next please. And so um, what I'm trying to say also, it's not in my slides. If we are expecting face to face, the same way as our face-to-face -face when we were children in school, it is not going to be like that. We have been monitoring only a week ago, I chaired a meeting of ministers of education of ASEAN, as well as, as Southeast Asia ministers of education, two back-to-back -back conferences of ministers. And we asked them, how are they implementing face-to-face? Each country develop its own face-to-face. -face. There are those who started and then postponed. There are those which are scheduled, for example, Bangkok, November, pa. And so it varies according to the situation of the country. And it's not like our face-to-face -face because the face-to-face -face right now of the different countries is very closely monitored considering that children were, uh, are involved. Now, I just like to, to close with uh, an observation. And I'm grateful to Mon for saying that whatever, we're, whether we call it a crisis or we call it uh, uh, a chronic uh, ail ailment, our present educational system is 123 years old, established by the Americans. We have had 37 secretaries of education, all of them eminent personalities. PISA was started in 2000. Present secretary is the eighth secretary of education since PISA. 
the present secretary was the only one who made the decision to join all the global assessments to, to enable us to look, because we were wondering, we have our own national assessments, of course, but we wanted to see whether the results of our national assessment would also be reflected in the uh, international assessments. And by the way, additional information, this will make uh, the members of MAP uh, happy. Uh, we have always repeatedly informed media that we have 20 schools all over the country whose scores are either higher or equivalent to OECD schools. But nobody notices that we have schools who are doing very, very well because we are in despair over those who are at the bottom, which is probably the correct attitude. And three of them are in passing. There's one in the Bicol region, another, maybe two, region six and seven. And you wonder with their strange accent and their odd pronunciation, how come they're very good in math? How come they're excelling in, 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 in the examinations? And we have to work on Mindanao because these 20 schools are in Luzon and in the Visayas and not just in, 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 in Luzon or in the urban areas. And I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated with, with passing. I'm fascinated with Baguio, who is stopping. Not so, I'm sure you are not surprised that Baguio stops in the, in the English uh, examination uh, out there in the Cordillera, even as they are wearing their traditional costumes. You speak to them in English, they will answer you in English. So, uh, in the words of Arwin, Lord of the Rings, she said, there is always hope and that hope was shared. And I would like to end with a favorite, with an idol, the husband of Marianela, a former secretary of education. Before he passed on, he dictated his so-called, what is described as his last, last lecture and he's uh, in the hospital bed. And he said, there are four things to focus on. 12 year basic education cycle, and we are into that already. General education, which is very important and which I believe in. I believe in fairy tales. I believe see. I encourage you to watch the film June, which was written in uh, the book, the set of books was written during the 1960s, what already predicted when you would have a planet with not a single drop of water and a single master for education. So I would like to end uh, with the quotations from my predecessors. And thank you uh, very much for this opportunity to, to share with you to meet up uh, uh, with Mon and Miss Bautista. And I'm looking, <laughs> yeah, I'm looking for my friends in, uh, in MAP so we can continue our, which is the best university for management, Mon, diba? Pero you, you won the first round kasi nalure mo yung one of my grandchildren. <laughs> anyway, uh, that, that's a joke uh, which we uh, share. So thank you very much for this opportunity to, thank you. to look at you, Nakita Ketarisa. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Secretary Briones. Uh, you know, we have this saying that uh, what you don't measure, you can't improve. So we certainly applaud your decision to join the PISA, regardless of what the results are. Because that's the only we, way. We knew what the results were going to be. Yes, you knew what the results were. Yeah, we knew, and we told PISA that. Mm -hmm. I, I said, it's going to be political. Yes. We're going to be excoriated. We are going to be attacked. Because as, as all of us know, we are aware, all of us are aware of the situation in education. But sabi natin, harapin na natin, yun na. 
Sige. So we, we move on to the Q&A and please continue to type your questions in the Q&A box. <clears throat> Due to time constraints, uh, MAP members will not be given the opportunity to speak. I will just read your questions. So let me start with one of my own. <clears throat> we, I think all our speakers are agreed that the education system suffers from chronic illness. It's uh, It might be at the critical stage, but it is chronic illness. And um, it's not probably not surprising given that among the, the 78 countries which participate in the PISA, the Philippines cumulative spending per student is the lowest of all. And the pandemic further exacerbated many of these problems and widened the digital divide. So unless we come up with something urgent we may be throwing away the future of a whole generation of Filipino learners. So Ramon presented great suggestions on what can be done, but this will take time. And uh, passing laws in an election season is always it's not always easy. So what do you think can and should be done immediately to address the learning crisis? Uh, in our case, Bon and I agree. And I'm sure Ms. Bautista also agrees that we are underspending. We have said that for the past 20, 30 years, we are underspending in education in relation to our GDP, of course, and according to world standards. Uh, we, we are aware of that. Uh, for this year, for example, next year, we proposed a, a budget for over a trillion. And uh, in the light of uh, uh, financial constraints, uh, uh, Congress is recommending 650 uh, billion. We proposed a doubling of, of uh, investment in, 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 in technology. And uh, we had to spend seven hours justifying why we wanted a doubling of investment uh, for in, in, the, in the Senate. And, and, and so um, you ask, what can be done? And this is where the different sectors of society come in. This is where the international partners come in. This is where uh, business comes in. Uh, an increasing number of, of business partners have been um, um, making, uh, uh, have been helping out. The, the, the challenge here is, uh, of course, uh, for business, for example, or for other institutions, they would have preferences. But maybe their preferences may not be exactly the same as our preferences. Our preferences, and, and Mon mentioned last mile schools, that is a preference. We are interested in the what we call the giga schools, those which are really, really poor uh, areas. But sometimes there would be uh, places where there is an abundance of love and outpouring of, 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 of donations. And, and this has to be uh, rationalized, of course. And this would need that this would need uh, cooperation among the, the donors as well as uh, uh, the recipients. So, kailangan um, talaga. And, um, you know, Mon, during this session, I am willing to, to, to I, because I'm not a gambler and everybody knows that. I, um, I believe that every other candidate at this time has a program on education because everybody loves education and everybody thinks that they know all about education. They may not know about nuclear power or virus or brain centers of the OST or, or, or the weather but they know all about education. So every other candidate has a program on education and perhaps we need to approach them so that such programs on education will be much more concrete and much more specific and probably will need more dialogues and consultation also with the proposed uh, uh, recipients to, uh, uh, as I said, to minimize duplication to minimize uh, also uh, obvious uh, preferences. And, and I think you are aware of the impact also of the Mandamos, uh, Mandana's uh, decision. You, you, you can imagine that the rich local governments will 
will have a war, while the poorer uh, local governments will not have uh, as much. And this is what we have to look at. You know, when there are 9,000 last wild schools, and we are trying to catch up uh, as yeah. fast uh, as, as, as we can, and we know where they are located. Neda knows where the giga schools are, I mean, the giga areas are, those really poor and remote, etc. Uh, those are already mapped out. Yeah. And uh, it will be a challenge to select them. Mm -hmm. See, who, who wants to support a school with maybe 10 students or five students and one classroom when you can have a huge classroom and full television coverage yes. and maybe a tax exemption? Yeah. So th th these are uh, talagang, uh, um, sabi namin, shared responsibility, yeah, you, not, you not one it. institution. Yeah, this is a shared responsibility, Secretary. Maybe we can ask also Ramon and Rina, what do you think can be done immediately in the next few months so that uh, we can you know, to address this uh, situation? Well, with this? If I may, uh, yeah, there are no quick fixes, clearly. Uh, there are things we can do immediately. One of Some of the things we're doing, uh, for example, address the gap between the output of the education system and the needs of industry and society. So bringing the two together uh, with specialized training programs so that those who have already graduated or are near, near graduation can be better prepared for the work that is waiting for them because there are so many jobs that are available and so many kids looking for jobs, but the two do not meet each other because of the gap. And so maybe that's one item that can be addressed immediately. And that's a clearly collaborative effort uh, to a certain extent between industry and the school. And that's happening in or in better organized industries like the ITBPO sector is the, but others have also organized themselves to a certain extent. So I would say that that's one. Second is as Secretary Briones already said, certainly improving, increasing the budget for education, even if education is already highest in the rank of uh, sectors that are receiving uh, uh, a portion of the budget. I think we're still short in relation to our ASEAN neighbors. The target is about 4%. The ideal is closer to 6%. We're below 4%. So I think as a starting point to address that, those are things we can do. Third, there is this perennial problem of stunting. And I think the sooner we start addressing that, the sooner we will produce kids whose brains are better developed physically and will be able to uh, participate actively as grown adults when they when they grow because as, as I think uh, Rina pointed out uh, some of these effects are just irreversible they can no longer be corrected if you don't address them in the first 1000 days so I would say those are some of the things that can be done fairly quickly but I think the major well of course to me the convening also of an edcom is important because I really think we need to bring our best brains together to figure out what is a realistic plan for Philippine education to bring it up to the standards at the very least that compares well with our ASEAN neighbors to start with and then maybe with the greater East Asia area because those are the people we are competing with and those are the people whom we will encounter in, in, in the rest of the world. So I think the sooner we address these things the better for all of us. Oh, sorry, one more item, because there are so many things. This this whole idea of connectivity in the last mile schools, I think those are okay, relatively, repeat, okay, repeat. Yeah, relatively quickly, because uh, it's it's just a matter of will, I guess, uh, and, and budget allocation of government. Government has to take care of these last mile schools, because economically, uh, it, it would not make sense for, I think, private companies to spend the kind of money that is needed to reach some of these schools, but they cannot be left out. That's where the poorest also live. And those are the ones who really need the advantages of education. So those are the things I would suggest can be done relatively quickly. But the final message is there's no quick fix, but the sooner we begin on this long journey towards improving Philippine education, the better for all of us. Thank you. Uh, I, I was smiling when you talked about uh, uh, gathering the best brains because uh, DOST is setting up a brain center. So uh, I wonder, <laughs> I, 
I'm just wondering <laughs> um, where those brains can be located. Anyway, uh, it's just a side, uh, a side observation. Uh, and that's true about the last mile schools. We, we have to invest uh, in, in the last mile schools as well as the so-called giga schools, the poorest uh, communities. And this is where the demands of technology are, 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 are most enough. And while you were talking, Mon, I was also thinking, you have a lot of uh, studies in the private sector management, mental health, which is now a, a serious, I mean, I will not say serious, it's a, an, it's a, 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 it's a phenomenon uh, which, Affects uh, which uh, permeates not only uh, our children uh, and but also the adults and our teachers, because dealing with fear, dealing with uncertainty, and 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 dealing with change and accepting change. When they go out of school, people laugh at me when I say that I tell my teachers that by the time our children graduate, whatever we have taught them will be irrelevant. Yeah because of yeah. all the changes that are happening. And how do we prepare our children to, to deal with this and prepare also our teachers to deal yeah. with change, uh, change as change. Yes, and this is idea. where, you know, when we have, uh, maybe in the private sector, you have futures uh, uh, groups because we set up a futures group in the Department of Education. I'm the oldest in the Department of Education with the youngest ideas. And it's a new unit to look, to peer into the future beyond elections, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Rina, anything? Yeah. Uh... Um, yeah. Well, for me, I definitely agree with uh, Secretary Briones and uh, uh, Ramon no, in their uh, suggestions. Definitely believe in KITE. Uh, and the sulong edukalidad of uh, uh, and all the things that uh, it, it's doing and uh, the edcom of uh, Ramon, um, but I guess additionally, you no, know, um, we really need to look at who are we uh, uh, educating today. It's not even anymore the Gen Z because they are already you know older. Oh, it's already the Gen <laughs> Alpha, you know, and yeah. we have to come from where they are. We have to meet them where they are and what is it that will really make them uh, uh, want to learn, be engaged, you know? Um, and these are the things that uh, we need. It, it, it's what to teach them, it's how to teach them. It's also when to teach them, right? And where to teach them, you know, all of these things. And I feel that um, uh, really bringing in the technology, bringing in the digital videos, you no. Know, Oh, and the different ways in, in the way they they will natin. want to learn, no? Um, or yung sa, yung sa, ano, original house. Okay, please please mute sila. yourself, uh, oh, those who are... Yung sa, yung sa extension. Yeah. extension. Um, please mute yourself, those who aren't speaking. Rina, please go ahead. Yeah, and of course, the, the other thing really is we really need to start from very young. Secretary Briones talked about mental health, no? Um, that the resilience, the, the social emotional learning needs to be, needs to start also from very young. They need to have safe environments. They need to, you know, be able to express themselves. Um, all of these things, learning, uh, it's, a, it, it's learning, uh, your, your reading, your language literacy, your math, um, but also the social emotional learning, you know, and executive functions and all of that from very young. And so I really believe that that foundational skills, you no, know, cognitive and non-cognitive, should really start at the zero to eight, uh, you know. And and us as human beings, um, we have the longest, uh, you know, uh, immaturity time, you no, know, of all animals and um so the caregivers our caregivers are very important our parents our teachers you no know, um are very important and so really um making sure that they are uh, 
up to the task no, of uh, caring for us, um, age appropriate, you know, and all of that and building their capacities is really very important. Uh, and so for me, that's really something that we need to uh, focus on. As Ramon says, there's no quick fixes, but we need to start now. And I, I really feel it's really the foundational skills. Thank you, Rina. Um, we have a lot of questions coming into the Q&A and chat box. So I'd like to request the speakers, if you could keep your answers really short to 30 seconds or uh, a minute. Okay because we have a lot of questions to go through. So for Secretary Briones, uh, would you enlighten us on what the department is doing about children aged three to five years old in light of what Rina told us earlier about uh, brain development and stunting? And uh, in fact, the World Bank said that the current generation of children will only be 55% as productive as they otherwise would have been as adults if they had nutrition and healthcare. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad Rina raised that question because in our pilot face to face, our preference is for grade K to three, and we were cursed and criticized. Why expose the little children to to the face to face? But we were advised by experts uh, exactly what you're saying, Rina. It's the young kids who need the face to face most because that is when their brains are growing this is when their absorptive capacity is uh, probably uh, faster than the older ones and this is where they will absorb uh, you know dealing with with other humans etc cetera, etc cetera. mas kailangan ang ng mga younger children ang face to face uh, at this time and so that is the reason why we are really focusing attention on the younger children because we are for their intellectual uh, capacities, but also their, their emotional, uh, uh, their dealings with, as I said, fellow children, with their teachers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They are the ones who need it more. This face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interaction. So, uh, yun ang explanation namin. Ang experts ang nagsabi niyan eh. And they strongly advised us na secretary, focus on the young children. Yeah, what about the nutrition, Secretary? Because the... I yes, think, yes. Nutrition. Are there feeding uh, birds, for example? Uh, unfortunately, uh, our request for... Kasi if we had our brothers, <laughs> uh, we would want all the children to be fed. Because it does not mean that if a child comes from a, a well-off family, uh, tama yung nutrition, yung mga baon-baon nila. It does, gusto natin sana lahat, the way it is done also in other countries. Pero na-reduce ngayon ang, uh, ang allocation for nutrition. At this, I'm glad you brought that up because this is a good area for... Uh, for business, for civil society to come in on the matter of nutrition as well. Kasi mas mababa yung ano namin. And, and usually, we pick out those who are severely wasted, wasting, etc. But, uh, um, and then it's only for a certain number of months. So, uh, kailangan nito uh, continuous and uh, uh, kung pwede lang sana, we want, it, we want it for everybody. Pero hindi naman natin yan makaya ang sabi namin na dagdagan natin yung coverage kasi dinadagdagan namin ng milk for example uh, milk products uh, and 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 also substitutes for those who who do not really take to milk uh, as many Asians uh, don't no so ganon na reduce yeah. kasi ang ano namin for for ang request namin for nutrition yeah. for the children I, I, I kasi the assumption is since limited naman ang ano ng pag face to face natin eh pwede namang malimit but of course what we are doing now is deliver the food directly to the homes of the children kasi nasa barrio naman sila o nasa mga schools the teachers also live in the same uh, communities no and local governments help out malaki papel ng local governments actually right but the can come in civil society can come in on feeding programs 
I think it's also very important for us to teach the the parents how to grow their own vegetables um, and uh, really be able to 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 manage you know um, the nutrition of their own children um, and I think there are several uh, organizations that also do this um, that that help the uh, the communities you know to um, grow their own vegetables and I think that would be a more sustainable I think a uh, way to to address the nutrition issue you know? um, they have to they, the mothers um, have to be educated the mothers and the caregivers have to be educated on nutrition and and yeah do their own uh, vegetables if, uh, if I may just add on this on this issue there are two other initiatives. There are two initiatives, well, there are initiatives also of the business sector that the secretary will be happy to hear about. One is called the Hunger Project, which is very much focused on what to do, the Hunger Project. Uh, and this Hunger Project is being spearheaded right now by Philippine Business for Social Progress. Uh, but uh, there are many entities that have agreed to collaborate including Caritas Manila and many other entities. But the goal is to make food uh, available not only in sufficient quantity, but in the right quality and at the right cost in the country. There's a lot of waste in the food chain, for example, uh, a lot of uh, wastage taking place. That's one way of addressing the nutrition. A lot nutrition of chemicals issues. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> also the kind of food that is being fed to the kids. Uh, so that's one aspect. And one of the focal points of that project is the uh, whole stunting issue because that is so critical to address. The second problem with the stunting issue is there are various government agencies involved because from, uh, from uh, pregnancy to birth, that is still under the scope of the DSWD. It's only when the kids start going to school that it becomes a DEPED a uh, responsibility. So there has to be something done to make that a little bit more cohesive. And we understand there's something called the Philippine PIPAN, Philippine Plan on Nutrition, or, or under the Nutrition Council, which I have been told is an excellent plan, but it just needs to be properly funded and executed. And I think there are steps being taken to execute it, but at least the plan is in place. So I am hopeful that that will take place. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rina, there's a question for you here. There's several questions, actually. How can different schools, especially the provinces, get access to the videos that you produce? Um, one, it's on it's on TV. Uh, the, the channels yes. that I mentioned earlier on cable. Um, yes. And uh, now on the Mahiwagan Black Box again. No. Um, on uh, digital TV. Uh, we're on GSAT, Satellite, no? and uh, various other TV platforms. But we're also online on our website, the knowledgechannel.org website, YouTube, um, and uh, I want TFC, no? uh, Facebook. So several other um, uh, online platforms. And we're also, we, we, we also have offline platforms. Um, which is uh, the Knowledge TV and uh, a portable media library with our videos. So these are hard drives. So if they do not have access on to on air to the TV uh, stations or to uh, online, um, they can get uh, portable media libraries from us. You know? um, and that's what many is, schools is have. It's very been accessible. Doing. Knowledge Channel is very accessible. In you know, uh, in family homes, you 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 can access, and teachers are also able to do that. Oh. Thank you. Maybe Many uh, venues. Oh. Rina, who will they contact if they need offline the hard drives and all of that? Uh, but, yeah, they they can uh, uh, email info at knowledgechannel.org. Yeah, I, I think that's the best way to. Info at knowledgechannel.org. Yeah. Thank you. Ramon, maybe you can take this question because I know you've been studying this for a long time. It says, it, the over, I get the over impression, one question is from the guest speakers, is we've known all along about the problems. We also know the solutions uh, for this chronic illnesses. How come we're still unable to fix it? <laughs> um, we, we, 
we need to um, we know that we know the answers to the problem, but I think it has not been probably put together well enough in a cohesive way. Uh, that's why one of our main advocacies at the moment is to convene an education commission to put this whole thing together. The elements are there, but they need to be put together as a comprehensive plan, we think. That's the way we think, I guess, uh, in, in the business community, uh, that it is best to have a cohesive plan that address all of these issues. Also, the problem is overwhelming. I mean, there are so many aspects to it, from nutrition to child education to pre-K education to the mismatch between uh, the skills that are being learned and the, the output of the educational systems all the way through. So one needs to focus. One needs to focus on specific aspects of it, Siguro, and what are the most readily address addressable, so that they can be early like you asked earlier what can be done in the next few months there's really very little that can be done on the in the short term all of it the other thing siguro is because the effects as you point out the effects of education reform are not re realized during the term of an administration it's not like infrastructure where you build roads and bridges and within the period the you can say there it is i'm delivering it but education is such a long-term thing. You need leaders really with a long-term perspective, and it needs to be carried from administration to administration with some degree of continuity, Sana. That's been one of the problems, I would think. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Ramon. Um, I, would I really, uh, Riza, when I was listening to, to Mon uh, present uh, the elements of uh, what can be done, there was very similar to our 10 point program, which we started at the beginning also of my administration. We, we, uh, we know all, Tayo uh, Lahat, I think you have 100 million Filipinos who, who believe that they know what is, what is wrong with education, but writing it up, making it right, and getting our, our, our act together, that, that perhaps is. Uh, the bigger uh, challenge. Kasi nakikita naman natin yan. And uh, we should not um, be, um, uh, th this is a race against despair because we, we despair, but we also hope. And nagkakaintindihan uh, naman tayo. When we get together, nagkakaintindihan naman tayo. But you, you, we consider also, of course, the various environmental factors. Like yung reforms natin talagang COVID really uh, uh, upset everything. No? Kasi nag na kami, wala pang, wala pang pisa, edukalidad na kami. Kasi sabi namin, quality ang challenge. Uh, dahil nakuha na namin yung enrollment. If you have 27 million kids, that's bigger than some countries. no. So, yeah. ang importante na yung quality. Talagang right from the beginning, but... Uh, uh, tama si Mon, hindi yan makaya sa isang administration, kaya all this finger pointing, uh, all these shrieks of this um, ano, of anger, perhaps can be uh, uh, directed towards more positive action. Okay, so, okay thank you. Yung, uh, so we, we have time for maybe just a couple more questions. So there's several questions on technology, I'll put them all together. So um, it says here that uh, technology is important um, in education and, you know, in face-to-face, -face, we understand the importance of face-to-face. -face. But uh, what about the online components of education? Should we forget about the benefits of that? Because there really are benefits in online education, especially in an archipelago. And even in studies overseas, I'd like to point out that they're finding that online actually enhances certain aspects of uh, the education experience. Is there um, something that we can do that are more strategic that can leverage technology to support our education system? And do we see a future where technology continues to be part of the education system and maybe online continues to be part of uh, the education system? About right. online uh, education, Thank you, Risa, for that question because it helps us to clarify, to clarify our position. This is not to say that if you go face to face, it will be purely exclusively face to face. This is why I'm saying, Kanina, 
you look at all the countries, wala namang pure eight hours a day face-to-face -face na mga schools. In, in some countries, they have one half day, two hours, one hour, and the rest is online because of the risks also, the health risks involved. And whether there is health risk or not, technology is advancing and it is uh, changing and developing every day so uh, hindi hindi yan ma mabura yung online uh, ang ang challenge natin uh, kanina i nearly interrupted mon kanina when you were speaking is yung connectivity yeah. kasi halimbawa uh, there are many uh, of those uh, lalo na itong mga bilateral partners natin they have very soft heart for the for those who are left behind, for those who are poor, etc., etc. Eh, but hindi sila makabigay ng mga uh, yung mga uh, gadgets like certain countries donate uh, gadgets, mga brand new pa top of the line. Eh hindi naman namin madala sa sa last mile schools na walang connectivity. So we have to develop connect a technology which will also allow maski walang connectivity yung yung ganong sinasabi nga ng 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 ng, ng iba and and this is where we resort to to television yung kilarina where we resort to radio at saka for me i i find it quite delightful yung ano yung uh, uh, nagtatawagan ang teacher at saka ang estudyante by by radio yung uh, anong tawag nga niyan na uh, yung nung unang panahon pa yan that is how world war II how many world wars were won by radio, di ba? Uh, so so yung mga ganong klaseng alternatives ang tinitingnan dahil ang problema, and it's not that it's uh, arena, yun, yun nga mo, eh, there is another, there are other agencies who are responsible for particular, ano, on which we are dependent. Oo. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we try to help the, the last mile schools, pero kung wala silang connectivity, not all the donations in the world will be uh, of, of, of help to them. Kaya yung mas, alam mo mo, nakakatuwa yung makita mo yung bata, nakikiwoki-talkie with, with the teacher, ha? walking on the road, talking to the teacher, yung hello, over-over, and I, I really like this over-over business because it reminds me of my my childhood also, and that is how I learned. <laughs> and, um, kami, kami, Secretary Briones, meron mga kids umaakit sa puno para may signal. And then meron silang yeah. little, little platform doon sa puno. Doon sila nagle-lesson yes. para, para medyo oh. may connection. <laughs> Oo nga. Yeah. Yeah. Pala yan, pag may kalabog, baka may kalabog. Yung connectivity. Basta <laughs> walang bagyo. Oh, eh. <laughs> saka hindi naman, ano, uh, I mean, uh, we, what what we do is try to push talaga kasi recently a uh, one of our uh, agencies uh, donated how many thousand uh, uh, digital uh, i mean gadgets the yeah. ang order ko kaaga nung tinanggap ko yon from this agency yung mga na embargo ba yung mga smuggler mga whatever eh di sabi ko priority to last mile schools kailangan onahin yung last mile schools. Eh, hindi namin mo, ano yung last, not all the last mile schools have connectivity. So, <laughs> most of them don't. Wala yung gadgets. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 Geographically oh. isolated. Oh, yan yan, giga mo. Re, ano, yeah. And, oh, Miss Mautista, uh -huh. yung tawag nilang Sorry. geographically isolated. Yeah, Secretary, you yeah. have time for just one last question. No? So can I just um, ask you, no? it says congratulations on the improvement of the teachers a lot. And what about the improvement of the quality of education? Said here in one province, I know the rural area teachers spend more time at and meetings and the pupils do nothing. So at the end of the year, they just promote everyone. So we have grade five pupils who cannot read or write should there be more supervision of these, these teachers and related to this is also the observation that our curriculum maybe needs updating especially in stem because uh the lessons appear to be still what we were learning several decades ago so maybe you can uh, address that secretary it's our last question uh you you uh, this is where uh you can also uh the private sector and civil society Kasi yung third, ang third na important ano namin, kaya kanina sinabi ko, if you have a brilliant student, you can 
it's very likely that there is a brilliant teacher somewhere. Kaya Isayan, we, we, we have initiated this program on the we have this National uh, uh, Educators Academy, the NAYAP. It has transformed namin yan completely overhaul. Una yung curriculum, biro mo naman 15,000 ka learning ano, uh, capacities ang required. We reduce that to five para mga bata naman matuto na mag-reason, mag, mag, mag uh, uh, critically analyze. So, uh, 5,000 na lang yun. Tapos yung sinabi ninyo na ano, uh, kailangan i-upgrade ang mga teachers. This is a uh, a, a challenge uh, uh, more because uh, as all of us know education is trifocalized it's yeah. not it's not uh, the same as in other countries when the minister of education has control over the pre job training and formation of the teacher so uh, uh, this is where we have to to uh, collaborate uh, more with 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 another uh, uh, ano, uh, another institution uh, which is uh, in charge of the pre-training of the teachers, so uh, we able to do on, only only uh, so much. And I quite agree. Uh, sinabi ko na nga, by the time of graduating mga bata natin, whatever we teach them. Um, a great deal of that will already be relevant because of the advances in, in technology and in knowledge. Uh, and, and before we uh, close, because last question, I thought we should not forget that we are Filipinos, that we have a history, that we have culture. And, 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 and culture uh, is identity is, is, is very uh, important to us and which differentiates us from the robots. So even you know in other countries they're already thinking one of, of robot teachers because it's efficient you know? the robot. robot teachers know what the students are up to what they're thinking they are wired to each other kom board basila na kai kinig basila na toto basila at saka siguro uh, 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 well, I will, I, I will not go into that anymore. Then magagalit yung mga human teachers if I, <laughs> yun. yun. <laughs> Pero even in our conferences, the, the leading uh, countries na napakataas ng level and technology nila sa teaching yeah. uh, say yeah. themselves na ayaw nila ng robot teachers. Kami sa Asia, hindi kami ano dyan, hindi namin yan types. Uh, may mga robot implants and, and, and so on. Uh, the human aspect is still very, very important. It's important for us in our culture. I believe in fairy tales. Yeah. So, Please, uh, just a quick, just research fairy just tales very... the genies, the ba? The genies very... produce the building, uh, give you jewelry and so on. Technology very quick does comment, Risa. It's a uh, present genies. Yes. Sorry. Uh, Go ahead. You know, well, just one very quick comment. One of the key items that we think the Education Commission should address is this whole issue of the governance of the education sector. That idea of whether we should keep it the way it is, where it is segmented, or whether we should bring it back together. Like Armand Fabella said in his final lecture or whatever, final sermon, there should be just one. It's one, one mind. In fact, that's why he quit as education secretary under Ramos. When the EDCOM when the EDCOM, when the EDCOM report came out and it said it was going to split it up, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here because I don't believe that that's the way to do it. That's one of the key issues. And many countries have either remained or gone back to the idea of one boss for the entire no, yeah, sort of coordination. But there are other countries who also continue with the, the way we're doing yes. it. Look at Singapore. Did you yeah. Singapore split up. Yeah. Thailand yeah. split up. Some split up, some Indonesia. split up and, and then came back. back. So it's an ongoing issue, but it needs to be discussed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also See? hope that they will include the preschool, you know, in that uh, whole <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, education yeah. continuum. Yeah, 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 not yeah. just the Chad, Deb, Ed, and Testa. Yeah. Hey, we're, we're over time. Sorry about that. Uh, but uh, there's just a final suggestion I'll leave you with, um, um, uh, Secretary Bionis, that came from one of our attendees to please include in the budget of the Deb, Ed, videos to supplement the curriculum that's developed by the classroom. Yeah. 
Sayang Mike. walang time. I would have shown you. Uh, uh, ang video namin is largely music dancing. Okay. Like concepts. Yung yung one of our uh, finalists sa Global Teacher of the of the Year. Yung yung international contest na one million dollars ang award. PhD in mathematics, IP. He used IP designs to teach triangles. Yung ganon. Tapos nagsasayaw sila. A very very you know very interesting way. and and I myself uh, require that I uh, I handle uh, I will I will send it to you privately mo para makita mo yung tree of life mo. <laughs> sure sure sure. Okay. Salamat <laughs> salamat. My favorite tree. <laughs> and uh -oh. and Mata group is that is that what you said? <laughs> Okay, thank you very much to our speakers. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'd like to call on uh, the President Gigi before we adjourn. Any closing, any final words for us? Well, I think the speakers have more than distinguished themselves. I think nice discussion of beginning to end uh, over the years, the friendly. need for private sector. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. And, and then to, to, to work together because we all have to look uh, forward no? and many good suggestions coming uh, from all sides. So le let's be proactive. Let's continue to work uh, with each other. And thank you very much, Secretary Briones, for being so supportive to the education sector. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much again to Secretary Briones, Ramon, Rina for sharing your time and expertise with us. May we ask you to keep your videos on for a short photo op. Thank you. Nice to see you again, Sec Liling. Oh, <laughs> and nice to have this opportunity. Let's, let's continue our argument as to which is the better university, yours or mine. Kala ko tapos na yun. Clearly, it's Lasal. Oh, First round lang yun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I agree, I agree. Huh? <laughs> Secretary, I think we're in the same side. <laughs> no, she's not looking to say Siliman. Siliman ah, is the sponsor. <laughs> Secretary. It's Siliman University. A very... Oh. Our mother is done with the photo. Only Magtolises go. And there is one Magtolis who wants to go to Mons School. <laughs> who is in the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, only one. <laughs> okay. Okay. One, but uh, one. very happy. Okay. One. I know that we done with the photo. One. All right. One, one more, two, though. One more. Three. Another one, please. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, you. everyone. Thank you, Enjoy. everyone. Thank you for All joining us. Thank you. Good thank luck. you, Risa. Thank, 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 thank you, Ramon. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you, Risa. Yeah. Uh, Montenola, Visayan? Uh, yes. That's uh -oh. <laughs> the dental side. Thank you very okay. much, Secretary. Um, you may not remember, I was with you in Isabella when we inaugurated our classrooms that we donated. Uh -oh. And life Oh, at saka yung mga musical numbers. <laughs> Thank you very okay. much. Bye-bye.